This is the Full Disclosure Show on the Restoring the Faith Media YouTube channel. I'm Mike. And this is Joe. Uh, in this show, we're bringing you up close and personal with notable authors, speakers, and uh, broadcasters of various academic, media, and even ecclesiastical backgrounds so you can learn more about their personal story. Please subscribe to the show, click the bell, and share this channel with your friends and family so that we can get this channel growing faster. The faster this channel grows, the more content we can bring you. Amen. Now, as you already know, this show is designed to be an intimate and informative look at the men and women who are engaged in Catholic topics and in the fight for a Christian cult culture at large. Some of the guests on this show will have very strong opinions, even controversial ones. It must be noted that the opinions of the guests on this show do not necessarily represent the opinions of restoring the faith. However, if you are interested in hearing more from Joe and me and the rest of the R RTF team, you can check out our weekly show called Living the Faith, which is both on this channel and released worldwide in podcast format. Our guest today is Dr. Peter Kwasniewski, and I'm pronouncing that right, Kwasniewski, a full-time author and speaker who's writing on liturgy, sacraments, music, and fine arts, social ethics, and contemporary issues can be read regularly. You know who this man is, even if you don't. You've read his work at uh, New Liturgical Movement. 1 Peter 5, Life Sight News, and uh, Rorate Celli. He is a composer himself of sacred music, which is so cool, I want to get into that, whose Latin and English choral pieces have been performed around the world. To date, uh, Dr. Kwasniewski has, I said it wrong, has published <laughs> a lot of books. Um, one, one of his books I'm holding, it is called Noble Beauty, Transcendent Holiness. I'm a big fan of this book. You can get this here, I'm going to put it up on the screen. You can get this book anywhere. You can get it on Amazon. Probably uh, Peter wants you to buy it on from his publisher direct. I suspect that's better for him. But the most recent uh, book that he published is John Henry Newman on worship, reverence, and ritual. Doctor, thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to it. Well, this is really exciting. So I... I came across your name on LifeSite News, um, and that was some, some time ago. How long have you been writing? In general, on Catholic themes? Yes, sir. Um, I published my first article on Gregor... My first article ever in a periodical was in a now-defunct Ignatius Press magazine called The Catholic Faith, and that would have been around the year 1994, 95. Okay. So, so we're talking about uh, what's that? Twenty-five years. Wow. Yeah. Well, congratulations. So, you are broadcasting from uh, Wisconsin. Is that correct? No, no, uh, Lincoln, Nebraska. Oh, from Lincoln. Uh, okay, interesting. Is that where you live full time? Yes. Yes. Yeah. This is my. I, I can't really call it a man cave. It's a bit too elegant for that. But this is where the. <laughs> The magic happens, so to speak. Well, I think we've got to take back that term because this is our man cave, Joe and Mike. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we've, we've got to reclaim the term. This is what a man cave should look like. Yes. Um, interesting. So, Houston, we have a problem. I want to start with a, ver a recent issue uh, that you had to deal with. There were potentially going to be protesters in Houston, Texas, who were trying to block you from speaking out on what is it that you are saying these days that is so controversial to people? Well, you know, I, I say a lot of controversial things, um, but uh, I, that's not my intention. My intention is just to speak the truth as I see it. Um, on the other hand, that, that uh, has become a controversial act. Um, no, in Houston, I was invited to come and speak at a very large, uh, actually the third largest parish in the Archdiocese of Galveston, Houston, by uh, the, the new pastor who's very sympathetic to all things traditional um, and who's starting up the, the Latin Mass at his parish where it's where it has never existed before since the parish was built, um, and uh, I mean this is a parish of thousands of families. So naturally, when my visit was announced that I was going to come and give a few talks on why it's good news for the for the extraordinary form, as I had to call it, uh, to to come back. Um, you know, apparently the priest was told that there were going to be a number of parishioners protesting my arrival uh, at the parish, but. In the event that never happened, so and, and in fact it was very well received. There were about 300 people there. Mm. Um, gave three talks and uh, had a question and answer period that was very civil. You know, there were some people who disagreed, but it was uh, certainly no fisticuffs or 
or blood spilling, bloodletting. Um, and in the end, I have to say that uh, it was a very positive experience. It was a great example of just a lot of ordinary Catholics who want to learn more about their faith, more about the traditions of the faith. Um, and, and so we, that's what we did. Well, that's fantastic. Um, what we would like to do is maybe walk through your background and training so people can understand the man behind the articles that we are all reading and devouring, um, what makes him tick. So, first of all, are you a convert to the faith, or did you grow up in the faith? No, I, no, I grew up, I grew up in, a, in a practicing family. Um, I'm the youngest of six children. My parents were very faithful mass-goers every Sunday and Holy Day. Um, but, you know, I, I did grow up in St. Suburbia Parish, uh, like so many other people. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a church in, in northern New Jersey that I like to describe as covered with carpet and extraordinary ministers. Um, and so it... <laughs> and, and, um, par- and particles of our Lord, no doubt. Well, yes, let's, let's, let's not go there. Um, but so, I mean, I, I grew up really only seeing post-Vatican II, in Novus Ordo, how low can you go Catholicism? Um the music program at the parish, though, was very lavish. Um, it's a parish with a lot of wealth. And and so they were always putting on grand musical events. The musical, the music now would churn my stomach in terms of the, you know, the, the styles. But yeah. um, they, they put a high premium on music. I was involved in the children's choir. I was in a sort of young adult contemporary choir. I didn't know any better. I was just... I just enjoyed singing, you know. Um, I was in the, you here, I went doctor. into the adult choir, um, and we got to sing some decent things there, like John Rutter once in a while and Handel's uh, Hallelujah Chorus and stuff. So, I mean, it had a few classics mixed in with the Marty Haugen kind of stuff. But, um, but yeah, that was, in a way, I guess like, I would like to say that my first introduction to the liturgy was thoroughly musical, even though it wasn't chant, it wasn't polyphony, it wasn't anything really special um, for the most part. Um, but my, but I had this strong sense that the Catholic liturgy is musical. It has to do with singing. Um, and, uh, and it's, you know, it's, it's not just uh, a bunch of people reading texts all the time. Um, and so, so that was, you know, that was really kind of how I, I got my feet wet. But, and at that time I was an altar boy. Then I became a lector. Then I became an extraordinary minister, uh, May the Lord have mercy on me. Um, and uh, and I just went through all of that. Um, I probably would have fallen away from the faith sooner or later because it had no roots. It's like when our Lord talks in the parable about the um, the sower uh, and the seed. So it, it there was no intellectual foundation whatsoever, and I wasn't really getting that from 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 my religion classes or from the sermons homilies, <clears throat> but. Then I got hooked in high school, later in high school, I got hooked into the charismatic movement um, by some friends. And I think that was actually really important. This is one of the reasons why, although I have serious problems with the charismatic movement now, and I've written some critiques of the emotionalism and the subjectivism and the Protestantism and so on that all comes with that, I, I, I understand why it's a bridge for some people, why it's a stepping stone, how it keeps certain people um believers, you know, or even makes them believers for the first time. Uh, so that I was involved in that for a couple of years at the end of high school. I went to the big tent meeting, the Steubenville big tent meeting that you've probably heard of. Oh, sure. Uh, and, um, you know, and then I think what the crucial step that happened for me, really, it was a double step in, at, in my senior year of high school. I took a philosophy course with a Catholic convert who was um uh, was giving us, and this is an all-boys high school, private high school, but he was giving us what I would almost call contraband, which was Plato, Aristotle, Augustine, Aquinas. Um, and <laughs> sorry, you, you're, let, me you're get, being, let me get rid of this. You're being invaded, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Imagine right. the audacity of, of, of handing a young man, uh, I, I, I mean, Plato and Aristotle, I mean, that is just... Exactly. So, so what what happened with with that philosophy class is that it just it just fired up my intellectual life. I had no idea that anything like this existed before. You know, I I was I was an avid reader, but I had never read philosophy. I'd never read theology, um, and I, you know, I just I was profoundly moved by the dialogues of Plato, by certain parts of Aristotle we read, especially by Augustine Confessions. Um, by the five ways for the existence of uh, proofs, five proofs for the existence of God and St. Thomas. 
And I decided in my senior year of high school, I'm going to devote my life to philosophy and theology. I mean, the distinction between them wasn't terribly clear to me at, at that time, but I knew that I wanted to do both. Um, I wanted to talk about ethics. I wanted to talk about the existence of God. I wanted to get into these questions. So that was one thing that happened, and, and that led me to Thomas Aquinas College. That's the reason why I decided in the end to go to a Catholic great books school. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that happened to me was discovering Gregorian chant, which also happened in, in senior year of high school. Um, I found this old Gradually Romanum lying around at my high school. It was a Benedictine high school. Nobody was using these books anymore. Uh, and I asked my music teacher, I said, what's this? He said, well, that's a book of Gregorian chant. I said, well, what's Gregorian chant? I've never heard of this book before. Uh, and he said, oh, it's what they used to sing. It's in Latin. And I said, well, can I have this book? Nobody, it seems like nobody's using it. He said, so sure, go ahead and take it. I still have that book on my on my shelf. Um, <laughs> War trophy. And, you know, I, I looked at this book and it's, it's, you know, it looked like it was hieroglyphics or something. You know what chant looks like yeah. when you've never seen it before, you know, like, oh, what is this stuff? This is really uh, esoteric, you know, this is, uh, and so I, I like went to a record to shop. Yeah, yeah, we, we had record shops back then. This would have been in like the, you know, around 1988, 89. Um, so I went to Tower Records, I think it was called, and uh, and I went in and I said, do you have any Gregorian chant CDs? And the guy looked at me a bit oddly and said, well, yeah, I, th I think we might over here. So we went to the back corner of the classical section on, you know, the fourth floor or whatever. And, and uh, you know, there, sure enough, there were a couple of Gregorian chant CDs. So I bought those, came home, looked up in the index, you know, okay, so here's the, you know, here are the, um, uh, the names of the chants on the recording. And so I just went back and forth between the recording and, and the, the uh, Gradually Romanum. Um, and I taught myself how to how to sing chant that way, how to read chant. Um, and I, I, again, just like with philosophy, but in a different way, I was deeply moved by this music. I thought it is so, it is so beautiful. Um, it is so haunting. It is so strange. Uh, and, you know, and, and that's stuck with me ever since. I mean, even though I've become very familiar with chant, I've been singing it for decades now. I've taught people how to sing it. Um, and I, I just sing it all the time, but it's still, strangely beautiful it is um it's unique in all forms of music okay so young high school student peter comes to your parents um and you are one of six children and you say i want to attend i'm you're in new jersey i want to fly across the country to go north side of la thomas aquinas college <laughs> this uh this radical idea built on the 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 great books program pioneered by you know john, guys like john senior i want to go do this and by the way dad i want to be a philosopher for a living what does he say <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah no my, my decision to go to tac was not was not greeted with enthusiasm uh, <laughs> my parents wanted me to go to Georgetown University. So, and I had already gotten into Georgetown University. My brother had gone there for eight years. Mm, and, wow. um, well, he went there for undergraduate and then medical school. And uh, so you can see we have another guest on the show. I don't know if you've noticed. So a little, uh, <laughs> <Hello>. <laughs> but uh, if he stays here, he won't make so much noise. Anyway, um, so, you know, they, they expected me to go to Georgetown. And in fact, they were so upset when I said I wanted to go off to California to a tiny school. Remember, TAC in 1990 was not what it is now. I mean, it was, you know, 100 something students, very tiny, had no reputation really to speak of. My parents had never heard of it. They thought it was a cult, actually, seriously. They, they thought, you know, um, you know, and uh, and so I, I, I made a bargain with myself. I'll go, to, I'll go to Georgetown. Yeah, exactly. I'll go to Georgetown for a year and check it out uh, because I wanted to keep peace in the family. It was getting to be a really bitter situation and or acrimonious situation. Yeah. So I went to Georgetown for a year, actually, and I, and I really hated it. I mean, it was, you know, I mean, I, I, not to be crass, but. You know, when they had the when they had the condom demonstration with the banana, I said, this is not the school that I want to be at, yeah. you know, wow. and, and this is this is Georgetown circa. This is 1989, fall of 89. And it wasn't just that it was many other things. I mean, yeah. I, I took a philosophy. I was in a philosophy course in my freshman year at Georgetown. And we started with which philosopher Kant. Of and then course. we went to Hegel. Yeah. We started with these philosophers. Yeah, yeah, students yeah. were completely confused. They had no idea what was going on. And I, 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 was the, I think I was the only student in the class who had any idea what was going on because I had studied a little bit of classical philosophy and a little bit of medieval philosophy. And I knew I kind of had you a sense of what Plato's cave was. Talking about. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, 
but anyway, so I mean, there were so many things about Georgetown that I thought this is this is ridiculous. So I told my parents uh, about halfway through the year, you know, I'm going to to California, and they said, well, mm. if you do that, then you're going to have to pay for your own way because we don't support it. Mm. So I, I said, okay, that's fine. I'm, I'm willing to do this because I really passionately believed in getting a good education. Um, it did have a happy ending, though, because about a year after I went, um, I convinced them to come out and visit. And uh, and they came out and they actually loved it. They loved their visit. They enjoyed the people they met. They saw that everybody was normal and healthy and happy. Uh, in mm. fact, th these small Catholic colleges, the students and faculty generally are much happier and much more normal human beings. You just have to visit them. You have to see them in person. You can't just read about them. Um, and so, you know, that did have a happy ending. My, my parents ended up helping me, you know, go to college there. And, and that was that was really good. Um, but I suppose just you asked me about, you know, kind of my 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 journey, my journey, uh, as everybody yes. says nowadays. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and so, you know, it, it did in a way it started with music and with um, with chant and with uh, philosophy. But at Thomas Aquinas College, I encountered two very important things. I encountered the Novus Ordo being done in Latin with sacred music. And, and that's pretty much the norm there. I mean, the Novus Ordo is as, you know, unobjectionable at TAC as you'll ever find it anywhere in the world. Now, uh, could, could, and you not just, just could you clarify but, for, our, uh, for our viewers here, when you say the Novus Ordo, what are you referring to? I, some of them may not have heard this distinction. Okay, sure. I, I just mean the the, the post conciliar vernacular liturgy. Well, the the liturgy of Paul the Sixth, the Mass of Paul the Sixth, which some, which he called a new order of the Mass, Novus Ordo Missae, uh, but which Pope Benedict the Sixteenth called the ordinary form. So the typical Mass that most Catholics are familiar with, okay. um, that was revised after the Second Vatican Council. That the TAC did that. That's their kind of norm, but they do it in Latin, which is very unusual although it's always permissible. Um, and they do it very reverently, only men serving at the altar, everybody kneels for communion. If there's music, it's Gregorian chant or Palestrina or some other laudable composer. Um, and, you know, in general, it's, it's done with such thick reverence that you can really pray. You can actually meditate. It's a prayerful experience. It's not just a form of, of sonic torture and... Yeah. and you know, and banality. And, um, and so, you know, I saw that for the first time and my reaction was, you know, give me, give me some more, you know, <laughs> why, why, why has this been, why has this been hidden from me? This is, you know, this, this going to this mass is so much more, um, uh, real. It, it actually, it, it looks like we're doing something that we believe in. It looks like we do something, we're doing something which is for God. Mm. Um, and not just for the community that happens to be gathered here. So that was a huge discovery for me, just seeing a reverent Novus Ordo. And I mean, although things are maybe a little bit better now than they used to be, I mean, you can probably find a reverent Novus Ordo, at least one in most dioceses nowadays. Um, it's still a tiny minority, I would say, are really celebrated this way, the way that they're celebrated at Thomas Aquinas College. Peter, um, when you first saw yeah. this uh, this Reverend Novus Ordo, as you describe it, did you f experience any feelings of anger or frustration with, with the fact that this, at least this style, which you were predisposed to having taught yourself uh, Gregorian chant, but did you feel like something had been stolen from you and you were and and you were discovering it and you were wondering why it was in your adulthood that you were discovering it you know it's interesting i i don't want to say definitively yes or no because um i you know sometimes our memories are, are not as perfect as they should be uh, but i don't remember feeling that way until i discovered the traditional latin mass that's when i actually had the feelings that you just described but we can get to that in a moment okay um, what what I think what I what I what I remember feeling is that oh I've arrived I have I've been on a I've been I've been on a trajectory mm. that started with singing and got into but in a purely sort of I don't know intellectual way an appreciation of chant because I still remember when I discovered chant I still hadn't heard it ever used in the liturgy it was just on a recording mm. right mm. so I went from singing to chant in a sort of abstract way to a liturgy where the spirit of reverence and the chant was actually being used. And so I felt like, oh, I've come home. Like this is where everything has arrived. Mm. Um, 
and in a sense, maybe I would still be there today. You know, I would I would still be a reform of the reform advocate. You know, somebody who says, "Oh, all we need to do is we need to do the Novus Ordo, the Reformed Mass, well. Uh, we just need to put the right smells and bells into it. Um, it's it's got to have the right music, the right ambiance. You know, um, you know, maybe we need to turn the priest to the east ad orientem along with everybody else. You know, if we make all these tweaks, then the Novus Ordo, that's it. That's the Roman Catholic Mass. I, I probably would still think that today. If I hadn't discovered the extraordinary form or the Usus Antiquior or the traditional Latin Mass or whatever you want to call it, the Tridentine Mass, you know, it has a lot of different names. Um, and I discovered that also at, at Thomas Aquinas College. It was there. It was marginal in some ways. I mean, now it's become, you know, they, they have it every day, seven days a week. Uh, but back in the early 90s, it was once a month. That was... Uh, courtesy of the generosity of the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. Yeah. Um, and, um, and then there, were, there was a chaplain who celebrated it secretly. So my, my introduction into the Old Mass was like Elizabethan England, you know, yeah. Catholics in Elizabethan yeah, yeah. England, right? The, the it was like, times. oh, the priest has come out of the hiding hole, you know, we're going to have a low Mass, psst, psst, psst. Yeah. low Mass yeah. at 7 o'clock tonight, kind of a thing. That's that's the way it was. Uh, really. uh, sort of like how uh, uh, Bishop Athanasius Schneider grew up. Right? Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> have you been have you been reading Christus Vinci? I by have, chance? I have. It's an, it's an incredible book. And it I, is. Actually, you're, it, the, you're the reason why I added it to the top of my to-do list, because you said it was one of the most consequential books of the decade. Yes, I, and I agree with that. I mean, and, and manifestly, it is when you take into account that it's an interview with a bishop. Mm, yeah. Um, I mean, that is to say, I think it's good on its own terms, but there are lay people who are saying similar kinds of things, have been for a while, but not bishops. Mm. You, you don't find uh, uh, successors of the apostles who are speaking with that kind of apostolic fortitude and clarity. Um, but... But yeah, so so discovering the the traditional Latin Mass, even in that somewhat clandestine manner, um, that really did open another world to me. It was it was like I described it once as as being like passing from two dimensions to three dimensions, or passing from a black and white world to a world of color. Um, and the the reason I say that is because I could see even just looking at the prayers of the Mass, and I and this was at the beginning of my falling in love with it you know now i know a lot more and i've studied a lot more but even at the very beginning i could see that the prayers were radically different were qualitatively different that they were richer more textured uh more realistic to human nature to fallen human nature um more idealistic in a way about divinized human nature that is to say that there's when you look at the prayers of the old liturgy the ones the priest is praying or the propers of the mass the changing prayers um, they are, they're more cosmic, they're more global in the sense of representing and expressing the Catholic faith. Uh, and, and that means the hard truths of the faith, you know, that man is a sinner, that he suffers concupiscence, that he, that he progresses, that he's in a battle with the world, the flesh and the devil, right? All those kind of hard truths are there, but also his call to divinization and to transformation um, you know, the, the, the nobility of Christ, the nobility of the saints, um, the miracles, the apparitions. I mean, it, if you ask where is Catholicism fully expressed in all of its complex richness and mystery, it's in the Tridentine Mass, it's in the traditional Roman Rite. If you're talking about Western or Latin Christianity, that's where you're going to find it. So what would you and, say to the person who's who's hearing you talk, um, Peter, and and they're saying to themselves, okay, look, I'm, I consider myself to be a faithful Catholic. I go to Mass every Sunday at least. You might even have people who go to First Fridays and First Saturdays and uh, certainly all the uh, days of obligation. They pray their rosary, but they go to the Novus Ordo La uh, Mass, and they're thinking to themselves, okay— you know, this this is this guy who went to Georgetown, he's a PhD, he understands Latin and what's going on. I don't understand what's going on. How can how can I enter deeply into this liturgy? I, so sure. what would you say to those people? Yes. I mean, the first thing I would say is, you know, uh, God bless you. I mean, keep doing what you're doing, right? Keep praying the rosary. Keep, uh, you know, doing penance. Keep going faithfully to Mass. So it's, it's not that you're doing anything wrong. I think what I would say to them is there's more. There's there's more in your faith that you haven't discovered yet. 
and you can discover it. It does not require a high education, a doctorate, Latin familiarity. It doesn't require any of that. I mean, I it, what it requires is the patience of love. Um, what I mean by that is the liturgy has always been understood as something so profound and so transcendent that it will take you your whole life to get to know it, just like it takes your whole life to get to know somebody else. I mean, your friend, your, your wife, whoever it is, you know, it's with, with, with God and with the things of God, we shouldn't expect to get it right away. We shouldn't expect to come to Madison's like, well, if I don't understand what they're saying right away, forget it. I'm quitting. You know, that's not, that's not the proper attitude to have. With, I mean, I can say I've been, I've gone to the traditional mass now so many times. I, I don't think I could count the number. Maybe I could if I took out a calculator or something. But, um, but I've gone so many times, and I'm still, uh, you know, I'm reading my missile. Sometimes I read my missile. Sometimes I just put it down and I pray. I watch the priest. I watch the ministers. I pray in my own words, or I pray in the words of the missile. However, you know, you can participate in a lot of different ways. But every time. I'm, st I'm still seeing something new that I haven't noticed before, either with my eyes, with my ears, you know, in my missal, wherever it is. It's so rich that you never get to the bottom of it. Um, and this is, you know, this is not something that is in principle closed off to anybody who can read or even anybody who can pay attention. Mm -hmm. If you go to a solemn high mass and you see, you know, the priest and the deacon and the subdeacon at the altar in their beautiful sort of sacred dance, you know, that, that, that wonderful... Um, uh, choreography of the traditional liturgy and the incense and you hear the music and you know you it, you're not it's not a cerebral experience it's not primarily a rational discursive experience it's an experience of what c.s lewis would call thick religion right it's it's an experience it's a it's a, a multi-sensory immersion in the prayer of the church and that's something that happens, again, it happens with our knees. We pray with our knees. Mm -hmm. We pray with our eyes, with our nose, when we smell the incense. You know, it, pr we have so much reduced prayer to a merely rational, verbal, discursive level that people only think about it that way anymore. And the, the church in her wisdom and in her, in her tradition has thought about prayer in a much more, I don't know how to put it, an, an existential, total way. It's, it's, it involves the whole man. Um, and that's something that I think when people attend, especially if they can attend a high mass or, or, as I said, a solemn high mass in the traditional form, they really have that sense of like an overwhelming multi-sensory, mm -hmm. multi-layered experience. Um, and that's something the Novus Ordo, unfortunately, is very one-dimensional, very horizontal, very rationalistic. You know, it, it aims at imparting a certain message in the vernacular, and that's it. Um, and it, you know, for me at this point in my life, that that's like eating white, it's like eating white bread, plain white bread. There's, it has no nutritional value, at least as far as the human psyche, the, you know, is concerned, right? It's, it's, um, it's a liturgy that, that has, it's very low fat, low calorie liturgy, you know, and I want my liturgy to be, you know, rich and thick and full of religion, you know, and that's, <laughs> well, and, and, uh... and I, and Wonder and Bread is difficult to digest too for the human body, so I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if you meant that, but um, I'm gonna just gonna throw that in there. Okay, so uh, no, it's like bacon. Anyway. <laughs> okay, so uh, Dr. Peter Kwasniewski, you've you've discovered this multi-sensory immersion into the prayers of the church, as you have said. Walk us through how then you 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 find your way into graduate school and what you're studying and what your goals are and thinking is at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I left Thomas Aquinas College, or I graduated in 1994, and I had already decided to go on to Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. to study philosophy. Um, and I had, I mean, it's interesting, I remained true to that intention that I formed in, in high school, you know, I'm going to study philosophy. Um, really, the reason I went, the most immediate reason I went into philosophy in graduate school is that I knew I would be able to study a lot of St. Thomas Aquinas, whom I had fallen in love with, um, you know, all throughout that period. Uh, and it was, I mean, and, and today this is still true, although things are better than they were in, 90, in the mid-90s, that the philosophers have always taken Aquinas seriously because they know he's a master of argumentation. Um, he is, you know, he's a formidable dialectician and logician, right? So the philosophers take him very seriously. The theologians, you know, after Vatican II, 
they were smoking their peace pipes and they were, you know, they wanted to read, um, you know, Hans Kung and Teilhard de Chardin and, you know, and maybe Puff the Magic Dragon and, you know, whatever. Is, so is, the, the is theology people, departments were a wreck. So they, they refer the to that as novel, novel theology or what is that? Is that what you're referring to? That class of people? Well, exactly. I mean, but there are many. Yes. Nouvelle theology would be one group um, of them. But I mean, they were some of the better ones, intellectually speaking. I just mean, you know, if, if you looked at at Catholic University of America's religious studies department back in the 90s, you know, it was like, you know, eco-feminism, you know, I mean, like, you know, Marxism and Christianity. I mean, it, was, it wasn't anything that I was particularly interested in studying. I wanted the real, I wanted the red meat, you know. So I went into philosophy. And in fact, in, in the School of Philosophy, I studied a lot of Aquinas. I mean, practically, I would say 50% of my coursework there was in Aquinas. Um, and that was just wonderful. Um, and that, and that, and so while I was there, I kept going to the traditional Latin mass. I went to a, a church that you're probably familiar with called Old St. Mary's in Chinatown, um, which is a church that, uh, you know, countless thousands of Catholics have fallen in love with the, the, uh, the traditional Latin mass at Old St. Mary's, including Justice Scalia. Justice Scalia was there every Sunday mm -hmm. and the Holy Day very faithfully. Very Everybody famously. knew I where think, he sat. You I know. think also Pat um, Buchanan attended that church. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Yeah, basically, you know, it was kind of a who's who of, of uh, traditional Catholics in D.C. Um, so I went there and that was wonderful. I, I just, you know, my, my love kept growing for that, uh, for that liturgy, um, that, that ancient, well, that truly ancient and timeless liturgy um, that developed over all the centuries. But um, uh, but then I was hired. I was hired by a place called the International Theological Institute in Gaming, Austria. Um, so I, I went abroad. I, was, I, I got married actually in 1998, and my wife and I went abroad to Austria, and we stayed there for almost eight years. Um, and I was hired ostensibly to teach philosophy. I did teach philosophy, but when I arrived the the president of the institute said, you know, um, you're going to teach philosophy, but we actually really, really need somebody right now also to teach dogmatic theology. Um, how's your St. Thomas Aquinas? <laughs> and, okay. and I said, well, I mean, I, you know, I'd be happy to do this. That would be an honor. I would love to, to teach. So I taught, I started teaching Trinitarian theology, Christology, more, and then I got eventually to moral theology. So those years were also very formative for me because um, just because I was in the right place at the right time and I was willing to work hard, you know, and just cram, 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 you know, till the wee hours of the morning, I, I basically gave myself a whole theological education as well by teaching, by having to teach all these courses in Aquinas. Um, and, and so by the time I left there, I had taught just about every area of philosophy and theology, which, which was great. I mean, I was talk about a privilege and a blessing and, and a true delight. Um, and so that, I think, part of the reason why, you know, when I look back over my life as I'm getting older now, you know, I'm, I'm 48 years old, I can see how God was preparing me to do certain things long before I knew that I was going to be expected to do those things or, or called upon to do those things. And so, you know, the way that, that I went through a very typical Novus Ordo formation in a suburban parish and the charismatic movement and the philosophy and theology, all of these things and the, the chant and the sacred music, it, it all really prepared me for being able to write about the liturgy, which is what I mostly do. I'm going to talk about other things too, but that's my, my main uh, subject. Um, it's, it's prepared me because the liturgy is, it's, it is a subject that comprises everything. There's nothing, if you think about it for a moment, right? The liturgy is the ultimate work of art. It's the ultimate work of human culture. So you have to have an, an aesthetic appreciation. You have to be able to understand fine art and music to understand liturgy. You have to have a philosophical mind because the liturgy is anthropological. It, it developed in ways that correspond to the needs of human nature and to the way we work as intellectual, volitional, bodily, emotional creatures. So the liturgy itself is, is, is a philosophical reality as well. It's obviously shot through with theology. I mean, it wouldn't exist were it not for divine revelation. Um, so I think the, the point I'm making is that I, I think part of the reason why disc discourse on liturgy is so impoverished is that there's a lot 
there's so much built into it. There's so much that is, uh, uh, it, it's, it goes in every direction. Um, and so I think, I mean, I really feel as if uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in a good position to be able to be touch, you know, tackling these questions right now. How much of your time do you spend writing about liturgy versus other uh, types of topics within the Catholic purview? Yeah, um, I mean, it's definitely, there have definitely been phases in my life. Um, there have been times when I've spent a lot of time, uh, a, lot of, a lot of my spare time composing sacred music, choral music, mostly uh, a cappella choral music. Um, I'm not doing that so much right now. I mean, I still do a little bit, but it's it's that's you know that's that that has subsided for now. Maybe maybe there will be some other future period of that. Um, I've I've worked in the past on social teaching, Catholic social teaching, a lot more than I do now. I do still talk about the social kingship of Christ from time to time, and I'll go into, you know, I'll get into fights with people about distributism and capitalism and socialism and things like that. But not, you know, that's not, that's very much, I would say, marginal at this point. Mm -hmm. um, it was important enough to me at one point, though, to compile a reader in Catholic social teaching, uh, which is now available from Clooney Media. So basically, the the readings that I always used when I taught Catholic social teaching are now available as a book, you know, and it's, Fantastic. it's, it's, it's an interesting book just because it so heavily emphasizes the earlier social teaching of Pius the ninth, Leo the 13th, mm -hmm. Pius the 10th, Pius the 11th, Pius the 12th. And it downplays the more recent stuff, which is frankly just extremely long winded very unclear a lot of the time and just it, it you know leo the 13th could say more in one page than john paul ii could say in 20 pages i mean it's just true mm -hmm. and and it's a, it's a it's a difference that you get to see when you study these two so anyway so i that book is is helpful because it fills a niche that uh, didn't exist before so today i would say liturgical topics all you know broadly construed including sacred music um, you know, that's probably 80% of what I'm working on. Mm -hmm. uh, so after you left the Institute, I, I, I know that you, you did a, a stint at Wyoming Catholic. For a yes, while. exactly. That's, that's what happened next. So, um, I, my wife and I had discerned that it was time to go back to the United States. We actually loved it in Austria and we miss it a great deal in, in Central Europe. But there were various reasons, family reasons why we thought we should go back to the United States. One of the most compelling reasons was that at that point we had a couple of small children and the Austrian government was passing more and more restrictive homeschooling laws. Mm -hmm. And we thought, you know what, we don't, we don't want this nonsense. I mean, this is just, you know, who wants to fight a government, a socialist government over the care of your children? You know? mm -hmm. So, so that was, that was, it. so we, we, at that point we, you know, I learned about, um, in fact, when we moved, it was the summer of 2006, we moved back to the United States. I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do. At that time, I had a sabbatical. I was working on an article on uh, St. Thomas Aquinas' Theology of Marriage, um, which was published in uh, Nova et Vetra in the event. But um, I was looking around and putting out feelers, and uh, somebody told me, hey, you should check out this new Wyman Catholic College. It's, you know, it's brand new. It, doesn't even, it hasn't even opened yet. They're still in the formative process. Um, you know, and, and, and being a glutton for punishment uh, and a workaholic, I thought, Hey, that sounds perfect. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, a, it's time to see, you know, check this out. Dude. Um, and I read their vision statement. I read their catalog. I thought, you know, this, this place really has a lot of potential because it, yeah. it read to me just from their materials, their, their kind of primitive or, or early materials. It looked to me like Thomas Aquinas College seen through the lens of the lenses of John Senior. Yeah. Mm. Um, and and I you know I had discovered John Senior more as a traditionalist Catholic. I mean that's the angle of Senior that I'm more interested in. But I but I really respect his whole vision of poetry and of forming the imagination. And by the way, I think I mean I think Senior was drawn to the traditional liturgy because of his poetic sensibility because he recognized mm. that with Aristotle, that man is, is that, that man, the intellect of man is reached through his senses. And the senses include not just the external senses, but also the internal senses, the imagination and the memory. These things have to be formed as well to have a good, healthy intellectual life. And so the, the, the liturgy actually, traditionally, it appeals very much to the senses and the imagination. And only through those does it try to communicate an intellectual content 
but anyway, now I'm digressing. No, well, so, speaking of John Sr. and so your experience at Wyoming Catholic, um, one of the things that Professor Sr. struggled with, um, and he wrote about this in Death of Christian Culture, is that the students, even at that time that he was teaching in the 1970s, had no basis for physical reality. They had mm-hmm. been removed mm-hmm. from being outdoors, which is something that Wyoming Catholic tries to address by in- intentionally throwing people outside and making them camp and making them. If how can you appreciate the um, the, the poetics of that people use the, the, of of gazing at the stars if you've never gazed at the stars? Exactly. Um, exactly. And, and so yeah, and, and that was and and that what was, was something that that really appealed to me about the vision of Wyoming Catholic College even before I. I contacted the founders of it to see, you know, if I could come out and visit them and, and get to know it a little bit better. Um, I really admired their idea of sending students out into the wilderness, um, you know, to to experience, you know, the sunrise and the stars and the plants and animals and just, you know, I mean, we it really is true that modern Western people are so cut off from nature. And, you know, here I say this in my basement, at least I have wood in the back. It reminds me that, you know, that there were trees once, but, um, but yeah, we, we really are cut off very much in the modern world from, from the natural order. And I think that a lot of the perversions we're seeing with modern urban life, you know, and the, the, I guess they, they talk about metrosexuals and, you know, like all the confusion that goes on in the realm of sexuality, for example, is really just a symptom of being fundamentally out of touch with the natural order and thinking that just like we can control certain aspects of nature by technology, so too our bodies are just like the rest of of the world. We can control them by technology. It's all, basically it's very Cartesian, you know, I have my intellect, my intellect and and will, that's my, that's who I am. I'm just this sort of like this, I don't know, ghost in a machine or something. And my body is just like exploitable raw material and I can do with it whatever I want. You know, John Paul II talks about that very insightfully in in, uh, Veritatis Splendor and other places. Mm. Um, So I I think Senior was was right about that. And I know subsequently, you know, when when students go on on these hike, these backpacking trips for weeks, they're often accompanied by uh, a chaplain who celebrates mass for them. And these chaplains, you know, very, very often, not not of necessity, but very often they freely choose to celebrate Mass ad orientem to the east, mm, right? Yeah. And so, you know, we can throw this, we can bat this term around ad orientem, okay, great, and what's, you know, what, what's the rationale for everybody facing eastwards? But if you're in the outdoors and the priest has set up Mass on a rock and he's elevating the host while the sun is rising mm. to the east, then the student has a visceral experience of, oh my goodness, like, you know, you know what I mean? It's, it's, mm. uh, the student has experienced what an ancient Christian experienced when he said Christ is the rising sun. You know, Christ is the is the sun, the light that enlightens the world. I mean, you know what I mean? So it's like the, the ancient Christians, they were closer to, to the natural cycles and the natural rhythms than we are. And the students who go out on a, on a course like that and celebrate that, that sunrise mass facing eastwards, they also, you know, then come to have that really strong sense of the cosmic, you know, that God has built Christian symbolism into the very cosmos, right? It, you know, Christianity isn't just a bunch of intellectual propositions that we accept. Mm-hmm. It's it's the language in which reality is written, okay? Mm-hmm. And so the reason why we worship ad orientum is it's not arbitrary. It's because the sun, God made the sun to represent his sun. That's that's why he made it. And he made it to rise in the east so that Christ could then compare himself to the rising sun of the east. So it's it's all, you know, this is all connected. Um, and we need to rediscover these connections, you know, in a, in a very immediate way and not just read about them, you know. For sure, for sure. But, yeah, so, so I, went, I, I, I got to visit the founders of Wyoming Catholic College in the summer of 2006. Uh, we hit it off really well. It was founded by three people, and I think this is unique in American educational history. It was founded by a bishop, a priest, and a layman. Um, that sounds and like so a almost beginning almost like, of a really you know, good if, joke. Yeah, yeah. Did, yeah, yeah, did they all well, happen exactly to walk into a bar at one point, or? Yeah. <laughs> and, and if you know, if, if if we had thrown a religious sister in there, you know, we could have had all the states of life represented. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I, I got to meet all of them, and as I said, we hit it off well. And then they hired me. I was the first faculty member hired for Wyoming Catholic College, um, and I, I went out there. We moved out in the summer of 2006. 
Um, and I was there. I ended up being there for 12 years. So very, wow. Wow. very f- rich, fruitful years. Um, I loved the students. I still do. I still have many friends there. I love the faculty. Love the curriculum. Uh, it's a great place. And in fact, my daughter is a freshman there right now. So, oh, congratulations! Uh, so I, I, I definitely left. You know, I left on good terms. I just, I really just wanted to pursue this career that I'm doing right now. Okay, so um, what and you're it was, doing now is 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 pretty new, relative to the yes, last 25 years. It's, it's I've been doing this now for about a year and a half. Okay. Uh, Full time writing, and and it's it's I mean I love it. I really love it. Um, it's a lot of work. Uh, it's, so I'm, I'm writing four articles a week. Um, mm. Monday, New Liturgical Movement. Tuesday, Thursday, Life Site. Wednesday, One Peter Five, usually, and then occasionally Rorate Chely. That's not a, a, a definite day. That's just whenever I have something to put on Rorate Chely. Mm. Um, and I'm going around giving lectures. Uh, as I've mentioned, I was in Houston recently. Before that, I was in Minneapolis. Um, you know, before that, well, I've been I've been all over the place. Uh, so last year, Australia and a number of other spots too. If so. if, if viewers of this show wanted to get in touch with you and perhaps invite you to come out and give some talks at their local parish, how would they do that? Oh, just go to my website, peterkorzhnevsky.com. It's very easy to contact me that okay. way. We will list your website in the show notes uh, so that users uh, can easily see that. Yes, thank you. I appreciate that. I mean, for you know, I've been surprised. It was, you know, it was, um, you know, I guess I would say it was a leap of faith. I, I knew that that people were interested in in, in my writing and and in supporting me as a speaker, but you never really know when you go freelance what's going to happen. You know, are you going to land on your feet? Are you going to say after a year this was really stupid? I need to go and you know and get another job somewhere and have a regular salary, monthly paycheck, or whatever. <laughs> but actually, the Lord's really been we both blessing me. we both know a little bit about that actually. So. <laughs> yes, I imagine. Um, uh, so, so I mean, it's just been full of blessings, you know. And and in fact, if anything, it's you know there there's too much there's too much to do, um, you know. I, I, you know, I get. I actually have to say no to a fair number of invitations just because it would, you know, I would never be home. I'd be try. I'd be on the road all the time, which would be really, really, really unfair yeah. to my wife. And also, it would be insane for me because I need downtime to think and to write. You know, you can't just always be on the go. You also have to, you have to read books. You have to think more, and otherwise, you end up just saying the same thing over and over again. Which, sure. which I try. I try very hard not to do. I always want to come at something from a new angle or, you know, some, bring in some new insight. What is your sense of the, uh, the end market readers who are reading your content, whether mm-hmm. it be on one Peter five or life side news, um, or new liturgical movement? What is your sense of the growth in that end market and the demand for the type of content that you are interested in sacred music, mm-hmm. liturgy, traditional things? Do you think that that market in the United States or in the English speaking world is growing? And if so, by how much? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think it's, it's growing. It's growing by leaps and bounds, in fact. Um, and it's, it's so heartening to see. Um, yeah, I mean, I, the evidence I have for that, I, you know, I've never done a statistical analysis. Um, I'm not that kind of person. I, I just try to stay away from math as much as possible. But, um, but basically, you know, I know this because all of the websites that I work for just keep having more and more readers all the time. You can, and, and then sometimes I can see, in certain cases, I, I get to see the, I guess they call it the dashboard. You know, see the website from the other side, mm-hmm. and see how many people are clicking through to the articles, how many Facebook shares there are, yeah. you know, um, how many people have tweeted this thing, or you know, and, and basically the numbers are just growing. It's a constant up upward growth mm. uh, in the English speaking world. Certainly, United States, Canada, Australia, England. Or the United Kingdom, but of course that also means throughout the whole world because there are always there are people who read English everywhere, and and I have readers in every country. I mean, you know, Poland, Germany, France, Spain, Italy. It doesn't matter. Africa. There are some people, you know. So it's just wow. it really is booming. And the other thing that I've noticed in you know in, in having the the um, the the privilege of being able to travel to a number of different countries um, and give talks in, in different places. Um, and, and that includes a lot of different countries in Europe, um, and as I mentioned in Australia, is just that even in the foreign countries where oftentimes the general state of society is even worse than it is in America, um, that is to say more aggressively secular, more, um, more anti-Catholic, uh, 
Nevertheless, the traditional Catholic movement is still growing in those places. And in fact, it's often the only sector of the church that's growing, uh-huh. right? I mean, uh-huh. like take a place like Germany. Germany, the church there is bleeding. It's, it's bleeding its members. Like the, every year, they're just sloughing off more and more and more mm. people who are just waking up and saying, we don't believe any of this. We don't want to pay our taxes anymore to the church. And, you know, because in Germany, as you know, they have the the uh, the church tax so you have to you have to declare what you are on your tax form so you put some of your money to the church and a lot of people are just saying i don't want to do that anymore mm-hmm. um but you know meanwhile there's a slow growth of the traditional movement even in such a hostile environment mm-hmm. so it's i i think i don't think the traditionalist movement is ever going to be huge in terms of absolute numbers what I think is going to happen is that the mainstream church is going to have one catastrophe after another that's going to rapidly diminish its numbers so that the the overall ratio between traditionalists and, let's say, non-traditionalists is going to get smaller and smaller. Is that, the, is that, is that how I want to say it? Anyway, they're, they're not, the traditionalist numbers... <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm saying. I, I'm, not, I'm not a statistician here. But anyway... Um, but I, I'm just saying, you know, the traditionalist movement, it's not suddenly going to go mainstream. Yeah. But the mainstream church is, I think, in many ways, it's like a huge pack of lemmings heading for that cliff edge. Mm. And I don't know how that's going to play out. I don't know what the cliff looks like. I don't know how high the cliff is. You know, maybe some of them will survive. But I can tell you that in this pontificate, Pope Francis has done more to promote Catholic tradition inadvertently than any pope i think has done for the past hundred years uh and and the reason for that is obvious right people are people who care about the catholic faith who actually believe it who even believe what's in the new catechism for goodness sakes i mean if, if they just believe that and then they look at pope francis and his you know united nations european union socialist um you know amazon synod pachamama whatever the heck religion whatever he's got going on they look at that and they say, I don't know what that is, but that's not Catholicism. And there is such a meltdown right now in the hierarchy of the church, so much collusion and cover up with abuse, uh, with abuse of children, with homosexuality and the clergy that, you know, it's, it's clear to anybody who even cares that there are major flaws with the entire post-Vatican II project. I mean, and, and some people, I think, are clearer about that than others because, you know, and some people read and they and they become, as it were, red-pilled or whatever. You know, they, they, they sort of trace out the causality and they find out, you know, here's why we ended up in this terrible situation. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't just a blip, but Pope Francis is the end result of a process, okay? As people come to see that, they're, it's forcing them, I think, really either to say, I don't believe anymore or it's got to be something other than this mainstream version of post-Vatican II Catholicism. There's got to be some, there's got to be some real Catholicism somewhere, you know. And I say yes, it is somewhere. It's always existed. It always will exist. When we say the church is indefectible, we mean the traditional Catholic faith is indefectible. That's that's what we're saying. So there will always be bishops, priests, and lay people. Um, who holds to the true Catholic faith as it's defined in all of the ecumenical councils of the church from Nicaea down to Vatican I and Vatican II to the extent that it's repeating the tradition. Um, You know, it's the faith that was taught most clearly by the Council of Trent. It's the faith that's most clearly embodied in the traditional Latin liturgy and in all of the traditional liturgies of the church, the Byzantine rites, the Eastern rites, you know. Uh, And so this is what I think people are coming to see. And that's why the meltdown that's why the crisis right now is causing this boom in the traditional movement that's interesting so so for your personal subjective experience with uh finding your way into uh tradition you were pulled into it by its beauty but what you're describing now is a bunch of refugees who are being pushed into it by the disaster that they see in their daily life in the church yeah i think that's true so i you know one way of putting it is, and maybe I could step back for a moment and just say, I think that, um, so so have you ever heard of Dom Gerard Calvé? He was the founding, he was the founder of Le Barreau Monastery in France. It's one of the, the most booming uh, traditional Benedictine monasteries in the world. They've got loads of vocations there. And um, so Dom Gerard Calvé wrote once, 
that there are two doors through which people enter the church, the door of intellect and the door of beauty. And he says the door of intellect is a very small, narrow door, and few people enter. And he means people who are who are persuaded to be Catholic by intellectual arguments. And he says the door of beauty is much larger, much, much more welcoming, and many, many people pass through the door of beauty, right? Um, and I think that's true. Now, I kind of, I guess if it's possible, I kind of went in through both doors. That was uncomfortable, but I, I did. So I went in through the intellectual <laughs> door, and I went in through the door of beauty, and I wanted to get you know, both sides. I wanted to get, yeah. I wanted to take it all, as St. Therese says. It's kind of a double door uh, kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Maybe that's the thing. Um, and so, and so, I think I would say that for a lot of Catholics, for a long time, the traditional Latin liturgy has been attractive because, primarily, because of its beauty. Because mm -hmm. they see there many things, such as beautiful vestments, beautiful chalices, beautiful altars. Um, they hear the beautiful music. They smell the incense. They see the reverence, and it's 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 an experience of external beauty mm. that that displays the invisible and inaudible internal mystery right because the the essence of our faith is invisible right we believe in god who is spirit father son holy spirit we believe in transubstantiation which is not something we can sense so all i mean in fact if you go through all the mysteries of the faith they're all things we can't sense we can't touch them that's why materialistic scientific people you know, find Catholicism so repugnant because they, they're they saying, you know, everything you believe, you can't empirically demonstrate any of it, right? But that's why it's it's always been the case in Catholicism that the externals matter so much to us because the externals actually reveal and they point to things that go beyond um, the senses. And so I think a lot of people have been drawn to, say, the Trinity Mass not because they knew how different it was, internally um, from the Novus Ordo, but just because they were looking for something that looked and sounded Catholic, right? Um, and I, I would say, you know, I can sympathize with those people because I was there for a long time and I still am there. I mean, I still agree with that completely. But there's a further step. Um, there's a further step. And that's when you actually compare the liturgical rites themselves, if you do that. And I encourage people to do that. If you put the text of the Novus Ordo and its prayers next to the text of the traditional Latin mass. And you look at the rubrics of the one and compare them to the rubrics of the other, right? When you start to do that kind of thing, you realize, oh my goodness, this goes much deeper than externals. This, is, this goes much deeper than smells and bells. This goes to what are we saying? What are we praying? What are we intending to do? You know, it, it's, it's uh, I mean, you, you know, you see, I, I was getting at this before, too, that you see that there's a profound difference in the lex orandi, the very law of prayer, what it is that you're praying. Mm. Um, and I think maybe that's I think that's a more intellectual approach. That's not the big door of beauty that attracts most people. That's maybe the narrow door of the intellect. But it's it's I think that's what kind of turns people from being just refugees at a Latin mass that they, they go there because it's the only reverent mass in town to being really committed on fire traditionalists is when they get to that intellectual step and they realize oh my goodness this is the expression of a different set of beliefs there really is it's not completely different there's overlap but there are a lot of things expressed in the old liturgy that are not expressed or not expressed clearly or frequently in the new yeah i mean that when you start to really perceive that then you as i say you move to the second layer it's this deeper layer. It's certainly to bring in a math concept. It certainly is a Venn diagram, and people can debate about how much these two circles do overlap. Your point about beauty preceding truth is a is a well made one, and I've heard it said best, uh, most concretely, by Dr. Peter Kreeft, who teaches at Boston College, and he mm -hmm. says that a woman has to turn your head before she can turn your heart. Mm, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, that's a, that's the kind of thing that probably would be called sexist. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose he hasn't said it in 15 years, and there might be a yeah. reason for that. <laughs> exactly. yeah. Yeah, okay, no, I want to ask you. Uh, I want to ask you about um, speaking of sacred music. There's um, and and it's sacred music in breaking news form, or in or in recent news form. It's not you know it's like not not it doesn't happen very often. But Archbishop Corleone's Mass of the Americas, which was just uh, mm -hmm. debuted in uh, Washington D.C. a few weeks back. 
Did you catch it? And what are your thoughts on the sacred music that was composed for that mass? Sure. Yeah, Frank LaRocca is uh, is a marvelous composer, very gifted composer. Um, I, I kind of like to think of him as the American Arvo Pert. Um, I don't know if you've heard of Arvo Pert. He's an Estonian composer, the most performed classical composer alive right now. Um, but uh, so he's a, he's a, he's a talented composer. Um, I didn't have a chance to listen to the whole mass. I just simply haven't had the chance to do that. But I did listen to excerpts of it, um, especially the Sanctus. Um, and I found I found that really powerful and very appropriate for the uh, for the moment for the liturgical moment. So I mean I think it's I think it's a it's a fantastic sign that we have a mass like that so ambitious, you know, requiring such choral and instrumental forces, being put on at the national shrine, the basilica of the national shrine of the Immaculate Conception in Washington D.C., kind of the flagship church of America, with a solemn pontifical mass presided over by the Archbishop of San Francisco with a packed church. I think I, think I read 3,500 people there. I mean, you know, this is traditionalism putting its best foot forward. Um, and thanks be to God for that. Interesting. Interesting take from, uh, from Dr. Peter Kwasniewski. You can see I'm struggling to pronounce your name in, in a non-phonetic way format. Um, <laughs> the truth is, uh, the man behind the articles that you are reading, the man behind the book, it makes sense to me now how I can hold up a thick book like this that talks about the liturgy. We can get a sense in this interview, and we're so grateful that you've done it to, uh, with us. We can get a sense for your passion, your raw passion and love for delving into the anthropological liturgy as you have described it. And I think that hopefully the, the end result of this interview is that your readers now feel a deeper connection to what makes you tick, who you are, and why you're doing what you're doing. So we're very grateful to have had you on the show. Thank you very much. It's, it's really a pleasure. Thank God you, bless sir. you, sir. Yes, God bless. God bless.